أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to the fourth and final session of our course on the Islamic foundations of the Ottoman Empire um, Just to give everyone an idea of, of the scope of this class uh, As we discussed earlier, the point of this class is not to give a uh, grand overview of all of Ottoman history That is far beyond the scope of what we can do in four one-hour sessions uh, people spend their lives studying just one century or one aspect of Ottoman history. So the idea that we can cover all of that in four sessions is simply uh, impossible. The point of this class uh, is that we understand a little bit of why the Ottoman Empire grew the way that it did, focusing particularly on the realities of the Islamic, um, particularly the uh, ilm-based uh, uh, identity of the Ottoman Empire, the connection between the foundation of this polity and the ulama, uh, particularly with regards to the Sufis, uh, like Ibn Arabi, who is very much uh, kind of considered the uh, intellectual grandfather of the Ottoman Empire. So with that said, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the 16th century in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, during the reigns of Sultan Selim, the first, as well as his son, Suleiman al-Qanuni, or Suleiman the first. This is very often considered the golden age of the Ottoman Empire. I really do not like, in general, using that term golden age. It's a bit simplistic, in my opinion, and it doesn't very accurately describe uh, uh, realities on the ground. For example, at the end of Suleiman's reign, you actually do have government bureaucrats that are saying we are experiencing decline in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and they're looking back at the previous century and saying, oh, that was the golden age. Obviously, in the 17th century, in the 1600s, people look back at the 1500s and say that was the great time. Uh, so all of this is to say that the scope of this class is to go from the pre-Ottoman era up to the mid-16th century, pretty much to the end of the reign of Suleiman Qanuni, and to gain an appreciation for, uh, uh, for you know, the, the growth of this empire, as well as the way that the Ottomans understood themselves as part of a greater Islamic tradition. Now, hopefully this is something that can inspire some people to go and read more uh, and maybe even to go and study this professionally as a career. We'll talk a little bit at the end of today's session about if you are interested in studying Islamic history in general, uh, Muslim history, uh, what are the steps that you can take and, and what makes good historical research. So stay tuned for that at the end of today's session, inshallah. If you remember last week where we left off was at the end of the reign of Sultan Bayezid II, uh, the son of Mehmet II. He, during his reign, he was very much the opposite of his father. His father, Mehmet II, obviously his nickname is Fatih. Right, the conqueror, he conquers the city of Constantinople, makes it the new Ottoman capital. He conquers land in the Balkans. He actually, right before he dies, sends an army to go and conquer um, uh, the actual city of Rome and not just the R old Roman Empire in the form of the Byzantines. That conquest doesn't really go anywhere because he dies before it can uh, accomplish anything. And Bayezid's reign is mostly marked by a uh, kind of consolidation of the conquests of his father. Now, at the tail end of Bayezid's reign, we talked briefly about the growth of this empire over here in the east, the Safavids. Now, this is another Turkic empire. Very often people think of the Safavids as the uh, uh, archetype of a Persian empire. And they are Persian in that they rule over the lands of Persia, what is now modern day Iran. Uh, Persian is the court language, but the ruling family themselves, the Safavids, are actually Turks, and they come from, you know, what is known as Azerbaijan. Historically, Azerbaijan was a much bigger region than what it is today. Today, there's a country of Azerbaijan on the Caspian Sea over here, which is fairly small. Even today in northwestern Iran, everybody or most people there speak Azeri, which is a uh, form of Turkic. Uh, and they consider themselves to be Turks. So this is where the Safavids get started. We have a man by the name of Ismail, Shah Ismail, who takes it upon himself to conquer all of the lands of uh, Iran under the banner of the Safavids. And he forces everybody to convert to Twelver Shiism. And this is when Iran becomes Shia. All 
right? Now, Shiism has existed in Iran and other parts of the world uh, throughout most of Muslim history, but it had never had, particularly Twelver Shiism, Jafari Shiism, never had the level of political control that it began to have in the early 16th century. Now, this becomes a threat to the Ottomans. And at a very superficial level, somebody can look at this and say, well, the Ottomans feel threatened by this because they're worried that Shiism is going to take over the Muslim world. And sure, that is part of it. And when we look at the um, justifications for the war between the Ottomans and the, and the Safavids, a lot of Selim's advisors, the ulama in particular, are saying these people are spreading a conception of deen that is uh, diametrically opposed to what mainstream Islam has always said. We cannot allow this to continue. But why would the Ottomans really care about what's happening in another land entirely? And we have to go back and think about the concept of political legitimacy. I know that we've talked about this quite a bit over the course of the past month, but we have to come back to this idea again. If you recall, after the destruction of Baghdad by the Mongols in the mid 13th century, the old notions of political legitimacy no longer exist. What makes you a legitimate ruler is no longer being appointed by the Khalifa or getting a letter of investiture. It's a matter of can you lead the jihad against the non-Muslims? Are you a just ruler? Are you somebody who has essentially kind of uh, uh, brought other territories under your control in you know, a powerful state? Now, the Safavids, part of what makes them popular is they go to war with the Georgians. Right, Georgia, not talking about the state in the southern United States, here talking obviously about the country in the Caucasus region. It is a Christian country, and the Safavids make their name as Ghazis against a non-Muslim enemy. So because of that, and they are, they are Turks as well, because of that now, a lot of the Turkic tribes that are living in the eastern part of Anatolia start to look at the Safavids and say, okay, well, our Sultan Bayezid isn't leading the jihad anymore, right? He is, he is not living up to the old standard of being a Ghazi. So they look to the Safavids and they say, okay, well, maybe we can, we can work with these guys. So this is how the Safavids now start to really affect what's going on within the Ottoman Empire itself. And Bayezid was not of the type of personality that he was going to take this threat head on. His nickname, as I mentioned, a lot of Ottoman sultans have a nickname that is mentioned immediately with their name. Like Mehmet is almost never called Sultan Mehmet II. He's Fatih Mehmet, right? He is the conqueror Mehmet. Bayezid's nickname was Veli, from the Arabic word Wali, because he wanted to spend all of his time with the ulama. He really was, he was kind of a bookworm. He didn't really care to go to war with people he wanted to, to sit with the Sufis and sit with the ulama and, and benefit from them in any way that he can. To his credit, that's a wonderful thing. Most sultans in history, that's not necessarily their uh, pr uh, number one priority. But one of Bayezid's sons, Selim, was of a very different personality than his father. And he's looking to the east and he's saying, these guys are a problem. And he actually forces his father to abdicate. It's one of the few cases in Ottoman history where a sultan... Uh, loses power before he dies. Now, Bayezid dies uh, within months after leaving the throne, and his son, Selim, now takes power. And Selim, he does not rule for a very long time. He's actually only in power for about eight years, from 1512 to 1520. But he is one of the most uh, effective and influential sultans in Ottoman history. And one thing that you can take a look at is his uh, letters that he sends back and forth between him and the Sultan uh, 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 Shah Ismail of the Safavids, because there is a standard of international relations that has to be upheld. Even if you absolutely hate your enemy and you want the worst things possible to happen to them, you have to write in a particular way. Um, and these, if you search up letters of uh, Selim and, uh, and Shah Ismail on Google, you should be able to find them. They've been translated into English. They're really entertaining to read. Uh, Selim sends this letter to Shah Ismail and he says, you know, you're my cousin. You're a Turk. I'm a Turk. You know, we come from the same kind of uh, background. And, you know, I really don't want to do anything to you. But these ulama, they keep on telling me, you know, you're causing all these fitnas and you're causing people to believe things about the deen that are not accurate. And, and everywhere you go, you know, you're kind of destroying the land. And he says, I know it's not you. I know it's probably just some of your 
uh, you know, some of your generals and some of your advisors that are causing all the problems. So Sultan to Sultan, let's just kind of talk this out. But if you don't happen to go along with what I'm telling you to do, which is to stop spreading your fitna in my lands, I might have to come out with my army and destroy everything you've ever seen. And uh, Shah Ismail responds with a letter, uh, similarly funny, in which he, he says, you know, Salim, you're my cousin, and I love you. And that letter that you sent me was just so insulting. And I know that you would never write something like that. It must have been one of your advisors, and they must have been high on some kind of drugs. So as a result, I'm enclosing a, a box of opium for whatever one of your advisors uh, wrote that letter. It's, it's really... I mean, this is 16th century trash talking. It's really uh, in entertaining to read, but you read between the lines and you can tell that something is happening here. Uh, these two people on a personal level certainly don't like each other, but at a, at a political and at a religious level, there is real tension here that needs to be resolved. Uh, long story short, we don't need to go into all the details. The, Sultan Selim does take his army east and he fights against the Safavids at a very eventful battle known as the Battle of Chaldiran, right? And this is in the year 1514. At this battle, Selim just completely wipes out the Safavid army. He does not kill Shah Ismail. Shah Ismail is able to escape the battlefield. But for the rest of his life, actually, the accounts make it seem like Shah Ismail falls into like a, a total depression. Uh, and he's uh, actually, his advisors get very frustrated with him and they kind of take on running the empire on his behalf because he's just not doing anything anymore. This is a completely demoralizing uh, conquest of the, of the Safavids. Now, Iran, if you look at a geographic map, uh, this land over here, uh, east of uh, the Mesopotamian, uh, uh, the Valley of Mesopotamia, it's a very mountainous region. It's not an easy pl uh, place to conquer. So the Ottomans never conquered all of Iran. They defeat the Safavids at Chaldiran. They get rid of the Safavids out of the eastern part of Anatolia and northern modern-day Iraq and Syria. And the Safavids survive. They're going to continue to be a force for uh, over a century, but they no longer are really much of a threat to the Ottomans. Now, after this, Selim is not done. All right, His nickname is Yavuz which is a Turkish word which means very strict or stern. Like he's not somebody that you want to cross. He's a very uh, down-to-earth, business-like type of person. He now sets his sights on the Mamluks, all right, looking down here at Syria and Egypt. The Mamluks are an empire which we have talked about quite a bit. They're very fascinating. Unfortunately, they're relatively understudied. One of the reasons for that is because they did not keep records the way that the Ottomans did. It's very easy to do, relatively, it's very easy to do historical research on the Ottomans. We'll talk about this a little bit more later in the session today. Um, because they just kept records of everything, and you can go into the archives in Istanbul, and you'll just find, you know, records of who's getting paid what, you know, every single person that works in the government bureaucracy, uh, daily accounts of what's happening in the provinces, things like that. The, no other pre-modern Muslim empire kept records like that. Uh, so that's why the Ottomans get a lot of the attention, but the Mamluks really should get a lot of attention because they're fascinating. The way that they conceive of themselves is very different from the Ottomans. As we talked about, the Ottomans get their start being Ghazis. They get their start fighting against the Byzantine Empire and saying, we are upholding this old conflict that dates back to the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we are defending the lands of the Muslims against, uh, against this old enemy. The Mamluks, on the other hand, they engage in conquest, but it is defense of old Muslim lands. They're not really interested in conquering anything new. And actually their whole uh, raison d'etre, the, the reason that they exist to begin with, is that when the Mongols, after they destroy Baghdad, they are heading towards Egypt and the Mamluks, the slave soldiers, overthrow the Ayyubid dynasty, which is a dynasty founded by Salah al-Din, which is now run by his, uh, I believe, grandchildren at that point. Uh, they overthrow the Ayyubids, and they defeat the Mongols, and they kind of make their name as the empire that just defends Muslim lands. They push the Mongols out of Syria. They push the remaining crusader states out of Syria. There's a few crusading uh, city-states along the coast that are left. They get rid of those. And they just maintain what they have. They're not a conquest-based empire. Now, 
the Ottomans go to war with the Mamluks immediately after the war with the Safavids. So you can see over here the Battle of Marjdabiq in 1516. At this battle, Selim completely destroys the Mamluk army. One of the reasons why the Ottomans are uh, more effective on the battlefield than both the Safavids and the uh, Mamluks is because of the fact that they incorporate gunpowder uh, in a much greater, uh, 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 in, a, in a much more effective manner than the Safavids and the Mamluks. Similarly, by the way, in, in India at the same time, the Mughals are doing the same thing. So Babur, the founder of the Mughal dynasty in India, he brings gunpowder to the Indian subcontinent and is able to defeat the Lodi dynasty of the Delhi Sultanate. But in any case, that's another story altogether. Um, why did this war happen? Right? This is always one of the questions that people want to ask when studying Muslim history. What? We can understand why the Ottomans would go to war with the Safavids. Right? They want to eliminate the bid'ah of the Safavids and they want to preserve Sunni Islam. Well, the Mamluks are also Sunni. Right? Uh, they follow the same, uh, I mean, the Mamluks mostly follow the Shafi'i Madhab, the Ottomans are all Hanafis, but that's certainly not a cause for war. Uh, they're, they're all Sunnis, they're all mainstream Muslims. Why would this war happen in the first place? This war is actually not very well attested to. There's a couple books out there that are interesting to take a look at. Um, one is on Ottoman Mamluk diplomacy, um, which is a, a fairly fascinating read. But we're not entirely sure about Selim's motivations. One of the reasons might be that the Ottomans were a little bit worried about what's happening in the Indian Ocean at this time. So think about the greater historical context. Uh, 1492, we talked about how the final Muslim state in southern Spain is destroyed by the Castilians and the Aragonese at that point. And Columbus sails across the Atlantic Ocean and quote unquote discovers America, which obviously we know that that's an oversimplification. The Portuguese, on the other hand, are not crossing the Atlantic. They're actually going south around Africa to find ways to Asia. So at this point in the early 1600s, you find the Portuguese suddenly popping up in Oman. They're suddenly popping up on the Indian coast. They're suddenly popping up in Yemen, along the East African coast, in South Africa. And the Mamluks were not known to have a particularly effective navy. One theory is that the Ottomans wanted to take Mamluk land so that they can stand up against the Portuguese because they thought that if the Mamluks fall, um, then Mecca and Medina are going to be uh, uh, in danger. And in fact, actually, the Portuguese were fairly close to Jeddah, uh, which, as you know, is the port city of Mecca. That's one theory. It could also simply be political realities and, and rivalries and things like that. We're not 100% sure. In any case, 1516, 1517, Selim conquers the Mamluks and they are no more. All right, it's a very quick war. He eliminates them as a political entity and all of these lands in the south here, Syria, think about major cities like Aleppo, Halab, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, Alexandria. All of these come under Ottoman control. Traditionally, whoever rules over Egypt also rules over the Hejaz, rules over Mecca and Medina as well. So those lands also now become part of the Ottoman Empire. At this point, the Ottoman Empire essentially doubles in size. Before this, it is, it is limited to the Balkans over here in southeastern Europe and the Anatolian Peninsula. Now, however, the Ottomans conquer old Muslim lands. Right? When the Ottomans are conquering in the Balkans, this is the first time that Muslims rule in places like Bulgaria and, uh, and Serbia and Bosnia, etc. Now the Ottomans are conquering some of the cities that have been part of the Muslim world since the very beginning. So it's a very different dynamic now. And as we're going to see, especially when we talk about the Almiya, there actually does uh, develop some form of tension between the old way of doing things seen in the Arab lands and the new way uh, being inaugurated in Ottoman lands. So one thing also that we need to address is this idea that Selim inherits the Khilafah in 1517 after the conquest of Cairo. So we talked a couple weeks ago about how after the destruction of uh, Baghdad by the Mongols in, 15, in uh, 1258, there does show up this guy in the year 1260 in Egypt claiming to be the Abbasid Khalifa, and there is a line of Abbasid Khulafa in Cairo. 
they are unrecognized by anyone in the Muslim world, uh, with very few exceptions. And we even don't really have a genealogy of those people, meaning that we don't know where they came from. They might have been from the Abbasid family, but we really don't know whatsoever. And it's for this reason, what, this is one of the reasons that nobody accepts them as real Khulafa. So one, th one thing that is very often cited is when Salim goes to Cairo, he finds the final Abbasid Khalifa and he demands or is given, depending on the language used, uh, the Khilafa. And the Abbasids officially hand over the title of Khalifa to Salim. This story has no historical basis whatsoever. We have no contemporary accounts of this event. The earliest accounts of this event come hundreds of years later. Now, does that mean that it did not happen? No, but it makes it very, very suspect because why would nobody at that time mention this? This is one of the things about conducting historical research and being a responsible historian in, in the manner in which you analyze your sources is you cannot just accept anything that happens in uh, or anything that anyone says about history as the truth. One of the things that we're always looking for is primary sources. We want to hear from people that were there. If nobody at that event mentions this, then that might mean something. If the first account of this comes hundreds of years later, you can't say that that account is necessarily 100% correct. Now I have to uh, put a huge disclaimer here. This is talking about Muslim history post Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and the Sahaba. You cannot apply these historical methods to that first generation of Muslims. It simply does not work because of the realities of the Arabian Peninsula and the oral tradition before the existence of the written tradition in the Muslim world it simply doesn't work. And we can have an entire another uh, class on this concept of the oral tradition, but that is not the uh, focus here. In any case, the Ottomans are de declaring themselves Khulafa before they conquer Egypt anyways, right? Salim already was being called Khalifa amongst a number of other titles. It's actually very interesting and, and in many cases entertaining to look at the titles that they are being called by. Uh, Abu Saud Effendi, who we'll talk about in, in a little bit, he uh, writes a huge tafsir of the Qur'an in the introduction. He thanks his benefactor, which is Sultan Sulaiman, and he has almost a full page of titles, right? He doesn't even just say, oh, I want to thank uh, the great Sulaiman al-Qanuni. He says, I want to thank the Caesar of the East and the Caesar of the West. I want to thank the Khalifa and the, the ruler of the Arabs and the Turks, the Arab and the Ajam and, and the conqueror of, the, of Bosnia and the destroyer of, of Kufur and things like that. It goes on for quite a while. One of those titles is Khalifa, right? What does it mean? It is not the same Khilafa as the Ottoman, as the, sorry, the Abbasids and the Umayyads hundreds of years earlier. And it's very important to, to, to make this point. Now, Salim actually does not live very long as Sultan. As I mentioned, he rules from the year 1512 to 1520, and he is succeeded by his son, Sulaiman, who has the longest reign so far in Ottoman history from the year 1520 to 1566. He actually takes the throne at a fairly young age. Uh, he's in his 20s. And this is the peak of Ottoman military power. If you look at maps of the growth of the Ottoman Empire in terms of sim simply geography, it doesn't get any bigger than this. Because of this, a lot of people want to talk about a rise and fall narrative where they say the Ottomans rise up to Selim's era when it reaches its peak and then the rest is a very long and slow decline, which is uh, an oversimplification that obscures the reality of what we're dealing with here. But we can say that this is the peak of Ottoman military power, no doubt. There are three main battles that Suleiman engages in. The first is Rhodes. I'll actually go back over here to point out where Rhodes is. Rhodes is an island off the southern coast of Anatolia. It was ruled by one of the remaining crusader uh, orders. And because of its position, it managed to harass shipping in the Eastern Mediterranean, especially now considering the fact that the Ottomans control the entire Eastern Mediterranean, Anatolia, Syria, and Egypt. They need to eliminate that. They destroy uh, the Crusaders at Rhodes, who end up uh, fleeing to Malta, where they build a stronghold that survives for a few hundred more years. 
Uh, we don't need to go into the details of that. Belgrade, similarly, the, uh, uh, this is the capital, uh, modern day capital of Serbia, and it has always been a very important strategic location. Suleiman conquers that city and essentially subdues most of the central Balkans under Ottoman control. The third major battle, this happens in the year 1526. This is the siege of Vienna. Vienna was the capital of the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire, if you know anything about uh, European history, it is kind of a confederation of mostly German states. Germany as a country did not exist until the late 19th century. Before that, you have a number of independent states, places like Prussia and Bavaria, Bohemia, Austria, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Vienna was the most important city and the Ottomans lay siege to it in 1526. And Spoiler alert, it doesn't work out for them. They are unable to conquer the city of Vienna. So while the Ottomans conquer Rhodes and Belgrade, Vienna is a failure. One of the reasons for this is because of the manner in which Ottoman, uh, or not just Ottoman, but European warfare happened at that time. Generally, the campaign season was in the summer. You don't want to be fighting in Central Europe, or really in most places in Europe, in the, in the winter. It's too cold. So the way that the Ottomans would operate is in the spring, they would rally all the troops in Istanbul uh, at the end of winter. And then usually like sometime in late February or early March, they march out from Istanbul and go out to, where, to the borders where they're going to fight. Vienna is very far away from Istanbul. So they march throughout all of summer for whatever reason that summer happened to be very rainy the roads became essentially just kind of mud pits and the army could not get to Vienna until October, right? At the very end of the fighting season. And the defenders of Vienna knew this. They knew they just have to wait out for a few weeks and the Ottomans are not gonna stay besieging the city throughout winter. So the Ottomans besieged the city for a few weeks. The Janissaries who are very politically powerful, if you recall, we talked about them a few weeks ago, they are officially slave soldiers of the Sultan. At this point though, the Janissary institution is a couple hundred years old and it has a lot of political power itself. If the Janissaries don't wanna fight, the Sultan can't really force them. This is one of the things that we think about uh, uh, pre-modern history. We tend to think that Sultans and Kings and emperors are all powerful and they are not. They have to balance a lot of different loyalties and uh, political parties essentially within the state. And the Janissaries are one of the most powerful. When the Janissaries say, look, we don't wanna spend the winter here. We might be able to conquer the city in a couple of weeks, but we're not going to wait and find out. Vienna gets very cold in November and December. We're going back to Istanbul. So Suleiman is forced to go back to Istanbul and the Ottomans are never able to conquer Vienna. They do besiege it again in the, about 150 years later in uh, 1683, if I recall correctly, I might not be 100% right on that uh, year, uh, but the Ottomans are never able to conquer it. So Vienna stands as the furthest extent of Ottoman military power. Now, everybody likes to talk about military conquests and, and wars and things like that, but I, I personally find Suleiman's uh, administrative reforms to be far more interesting because like his, what is it, great-grandfather, Sultan Mehmed II, Suleiman comes to power when he is relatively young and unproven. So now he becomes the Sultan, but there's a lot of advisors that are around him that look at him like this upstart kid, like why should we really listen to anything that he has to say? And these nobles, as I just mentioned, they have political power. They're not gonna listen to him just because he is the Sultan. What Suleiman does is he is very effective in managing those political rivalries and he essentially kind of uh, eliminates the old guard, eliminates the old ma matter, um, uh, manner in which the nobles exercise a lot of political power over the Ottoman Empire and he redirects all of the power pretty much straight into his own hands. One of the ways that he does this is he elevates his best friend uh, somebody by the name of Ibrahim Pasha, to uh, uh, essentially the Grand Viziership. And everybody's like, who's this Ibrahim Pasha? He's also young. We don't know who this guy is. And Suleiman says, look, you are promoted or demoted according to what I want. 
All right. I don't care if your family has been in charge of this job for hundreds of years. And that's generally the way that things work with nobles, right? You might have one family that is in charge of the finances, another family that's in charge of the army. And within that family, they exercise mo you know, pretty much total control over that uh, uh, individual uh, aspect of government. So the man's like, no, no, you guys all have to listen to me at the end of the day. He's very effective at that. Another thing that he does that is really um, notable and helps the Ottoman Empire survive for as long as it does is he codifies Ottoman law. Now, generally, when we think about uh, law in the Ottoman state, as well as other states throughout Muslim history, obviously, we have the Sharia, right? And we have our fiqh. That cannot change, right? As you know, our fiqh, the guidelines of it had already been outlined by the four imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And that system stands on its own. No sultan can ever overrule that. No sultan, for example, can say there's only four prayers per day, to use an extreme example. But on top of that, there's a lot of leeway for sultanic law, right? These are going to be things that are not necessarily outlined in fiqh. These are things that deal with uh, everyday governance. So a modern example would be something like a speed limit, right? What kind of speed limit are we going to, going to have on an interstate highway system? You're not going to find that in fiqh, obviously. Uh, there's no ayat and, and hadith. You might find some kind of guidelines that might give you an idea of the direction that you should go in. But there's a lot of room for temporal political authorities to implement laws. Now, the Sultan Sulaiman, he is the 10th Sultan in Ottoman history. Right. I mean, there had been nine more before him and each sultan is issuing their own edicts, their own fermans. Ferman is, is a uh, imperial edict by an Ottoman sultan. By the time Suleiman comes to power, there's this hodgepodge of laws, many of which contradict each other. Right. People don't know. Do I go with what Selim said a couple years ago or do I go with what Bay is the law? What Bayezid said 20 years ago or is it, you know, what Mehmet inaugurated? Uh, after the conquest of Constantinople. So one of the most important jobs of Sultan Suleiman is he sits with his Grand Mufti, Abu Saud Effendi, who we'll talk about more in uh, a few minutes. And he systematically goes through the entire set of Ottoman law and gets rid of anything that contradicts. They get rid of anything that happens to contradict the, the Sharia ah and, and, uh, and uh, the Hanafi Madhab in particular. Obviously, that's a no-go to begin with. Um, and they create a set of laws that serves as the basis for Ottoman law for hundreds of years to come. And this is why Suleiman's nickname is Qanuni, the lawgiver, right? He's one of the most uh, effective administrators and conquerors of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire, right? Uh, this image over here on the right side of the screen is the Suleimaniyya Jami'ah. It was tradition very often for Ottoman sultans to... Uh, build a huge masjid. And the standard for which everybody wanted to compete was the Hagia Sophia, this giant cathedral that had been converted into a masjid after Mehmed's conquest of the city in 1453. And it was enormous. If you've ever been to Istanbul, you would know, uh, I'm sure you would have seen it. It's got a huge dome. It is a massive, massive building. The Ottomans, again, remember, going back to the, their origins, they are or had been a border wild west type of tribe of of ghazi warriors they are not architects they are not engineers they are not great civilization builders so especially after they conquer constantinople they start saying okay well let's bring in the architects and the engineers and that's the standard the Hagia Sophia is the standard let's build something bigger and if you look at the massage that were built um, in uh, after the conquest of Constantinople, you see them slowly get bigger and bigger. You see the uh, Fatah Sultan Mehmet's Jama in the center of, uh, of old Istanbul. It's huge. It's very big, but it's not anywhere near uh, uh, the Hagia Sophia. And then you see the masjid built by Bayezid that bears his name. It's a little bit bigger. You can see that they're starting to get this whole architecture thing down, but it's not there yet. Uh, Suleiman, early in his reign, actually commissions a masjid uh, named after his son, uh, Shehzad Jami. Uh, Shehzad is uh, uh, like crown prince in, in Ottoman Turkish. And 
his, his architect, Mimar Sinan, is experimenting with how can we build something that is monumental? How can we build something that is big that can compete with the Hagia Sophia? Eventually, the pinnacle of that is this masjid, is the Suleymaniyah. And it is absolutely massive. If you ever have an opportunity to go there to Istanbul and you don't visit this masjid, you're, you're really missing out. It's really breathtaking. Um, and then Sili, uh, sorry, Mimar Sinan actually builds a masjid even bigger than this in the city of Edirne during the reign of Suleyman's son, Selim II, but we're not going to talk about that. Uh, this is an aerial view of the Suleymaniyah masjid. Um, you can see over here, this is the main part of the building. Over here, we have a big open courtyard with wudu fountains. Um, also, we have wudu fountains along the uh, sides of the masjid, which are all still uh, uh, in operation today. Over here, we have a graveyard. We have the, the tomb of Sultan Suleiman, as well as a few other Ottoman sultans are buried there. His wife, Hodrem Sultan, is buried here. And you can see a ton of other graves out here, out in the open. But what I want to draw your attention to is these buildings that are around it, right? This is not simply just one masjid that is built in on a hill in Istanbul. It is a full kulliye. Kulliye means like a complex. And what we see here, this is a uh, uh, a blueprint, I, I suppose, of the entire kulliye. We see the masjid right in the center, but very importantly, we see madrasas around it. These are Turkified versions of Arabic numbers, Evvel for Awal, Sani, uh, Second, Saleh, Rabia, Rabia. Uh, these madaris were intended to be the pinnacle of uh, education in the Ottoman Empire. So to give you an idea of the way that the hierarchy of Muslim schools operated, you know, you can study at a provincial madrasa somewhere outside of Istanbul, but the teachers that you're going to get there are going to be qualified. They're going to be good teachers, but they are not going to be at the imperial level of the teachers in Istanbul. If you can do very well in those schools, you can then kind of graduate to the madaris in Istanbul. And once you graduate from those madaris, then you can finally study at the Suleymaniye madrasa. If you graduate from the Suleymaniye madrasa, now you have reached essentially the highest levels offered um, uh, the highest levels of Islamic education offered in the Ottoman Empire, you are now one of the top scholars in the world. This was designed as essentially the, the pinnacle of Islamic education. Again, keep in mind the Ottomans are the first Muslims to conquer Constantinople. There are no Madaris before the Ottomans conquer it. Similarly, all of the Balkans and a lot of Western Anatolia, the Ottomans are the first people to establish schools, Muslim schools, or the first to establish masajid. It's different, for example, when the Ottomans conquer Egypt and Al-Azhar is already there, or when the Ottomans conquer Damascus and there's already a very strong educational tradition there. The Ottomans here have fertile ground to build whatever they want. So they create a hierarchy of schools that is very efficient. We're going to talk in a few minutes about, um, about that, uh, that ilmiye, this uh, religious bureaucracy. I also want to point out over here, we have uh, a uh, tip madrasesi, uh, which is uh, Turkish for a medical school. Right? This is also part of the kulia. Here we have a dar shifa. Right. If you know any Arabic, this is uh, uh, a house of healing. Actually, one of the a, a potential complaint to be made against modern Turkish um, and the shift under the reign of Atatürk uh, in early Republican Turkey, they get rid of a lot of Arabic and Persian vocabulary. So Dar Shifa, Dar and Shifa are both Arabic words. Early Republican Turkey says we don't want that. We're, we want uh, real only Turkish words. So they get rid of Dara Shifa as the word for hospital and they replace it with Hastane. Uh, Hastane is a house of sickness, right? Hasta is sick and Hane is actually Persian for uh, a house of. So you go from Dara Shifa, a, a hospital being a place of healing, to being a house of sick people. So you lose a lot of that. Um, that the depth of tradition and the depth of the kind of beauty that you find in Muslim uh, civilization when you just kind of uh, intellectually destroy uh, a lot of that history. But that's that could be another class uh, talking about uh, at the end of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so in most Ottoman uh, Madar, uh, most Ottoman uh, imperial masjids, we see this type of kulli, 
we see these, these uh, um, complexes that are built around the masjid that are not just madrasas, but we also find uh, soup kitchens. We also find uh, caravansarais, uh, kind of uh, hostels for travelers. We find um, hammams, right, a, a bathhouse over here. Um, over here, we have this line of uh, what's known as a Dar al-Hadith. This is where after you had actually studied at the four madrasas, you can actually uh, graduate and specialize in hadith. There's an important lesson to be learned here, which we can learn from our ulama about uh, why very often in the Ottoman tradition, as well as in the tradition that we find in the Indian subcontinent with the Dars and Nizami, hadith is actually the last thing that you study after you have done all of your fiqh. Um, but that's for another uh, uh, class. Today, actually, for, for a very long time after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, most of these madaris were not uh, occupied. They were kind of boarded up and, and just not used at all. Recently, however, they have actually started to hold classes in these uh, old classrooms once again. Um, so for example, the Dar al-Hadith over here, this, this line of very small uh, rooms, um, it had at one point served as dormitories for the people that were studying in these madrasas. So they're very small rooms. Um, and when you go into these rooms, you can actually see that there's like a little fireplace and you can see where there would be like two or three uh, beds all put together. Today, those are actually offices for professors at, um, at uh, is, uh, Ibn Khaldun University. Uh, and if you're just walking down that hall, you see some of the names on the, on the doors. And I mean, these are great scholars uh, that you'll find in Istanbul today that are bringing back this tradition of learning. Um, in, in these very old hallowed halls. Now let's talk a little bit about the ilmiya itself because what the Ottomans do here is really unique and very different from, um, from previous Muslim history. So if you recall, when we talked a few weeks ago about the, uh, uh, the development of uh, the Ottoman religious establishment, early on in Ottoman history, if you wanted to become a great scholar, you could not only study in Ottoman lands. You had to leave and go somewhere else. You had to go study in Cairo. You had to go study in Damascus. Uh, Konya was a center of learning. You could even go as far away as Bukhara and Samarkand in uh, Transoxiana, Mawara and Nahar, and, and study there. Because once again, these are new lands that the Ottomans are conquering. And they're establishing madrasas, but they don't have that intellectual tradition yet. By the mid 16th century, however, under the reign of Sultan Suleiman, this religious establishment can stand on its own. And it can create its own scholars that don't have to go study anywhere else. But notice how long it takes. It takes 200 years before the Ottomans can be a center of knowledge in and of themselves. Uh, and we see this in other parts of the Muslim world as well. I think I used the example of uh, Muslims in Malaysia uh, um, who were very closely connected to the intellectual tradition of Yemen. If you go to West Africa, uh, they were very closely connected uh, for a long time to the intellectual tradition of Morocco before places like Timbuktu and uh, Goa and others can stand up on their own two feet and say that we are intellectual centers by ourselves. But by this uh, mid 16th century now, the, the Ottomans are training all of their own muftis and qadis, right? Um, it's also important to note that government bureaucrats are also being trained at these madaris as well. So you would go, you would go and study your fiqh and your aqidah and your Arabic and also your Persian and your Turkish. Um, and you'd study things like balagha, rhetoric, you'd study things like logic, you'd study things like tafsir. When you finish all of that, you have the opportunity of going and serving as a mufti or as a qadi or as a teacher in one of the madrasas, whether it's out in the provinces or in Istanbul itself. You can also serve as a government bureaucrat. You can work as a financial advisor to the Sultan. You can work as a general. Everybody that worked in the government was a graduate of these madrasas, right? Today, we tend to think of uh, uh, religious study as being very uh, specialized. And if you study ulum Islamiyya, then you can't really do anything else with it, right? Uh, if you wanna be an engineer, you have to go study engineering and there's no point in studying religion. Uh, the Ottomans didn't understand it that way. And really no Muslim civilization in history understood it this way. All of the government bureaucrats, essentially all of the government bureaucrats had at least a very strong foundation in fiqh, in aqidah, 
in hadith, in tafsir. These were actual ulama. If you take them out of you know, the accounting departments that they worked in, they were qualified as actual scholars of the religion itself. You Again, you find this throughout the entire uh, tradition, the Muslim tradition. For example, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, uh, the great liber liberator of uh, Masjid al-Aqsa, he was actually trained as a chef, a scholar. Right? And if you look at Subki's uh, Tabqat al-Shafi'iyya, a biographical dictionary of Shafi'i scholars throughout Muslim history, Salah al-Din actually has a chapter in there, as a not as a sultan, but as a scholar. So this is part of our tradition. The Ottomans uphold this for a very long time. Together with this, we have a hierarchy of educational uh, and mufti posts. So, uh, you know, if you taught at the uh, Sulaymaniyya Madrasa in Istanbul, we know that you were considered to be a greater scholar because, again, the Ottomans kept very good records, and we actually have very precise records of how much everybody got paid from the lowest, um, you know, uh, a mektab teacher in a province somewhere teaching in a village, uh, kids. To, to learn how to read all the way up to the greatest scholars and the grand muftis of the empire. We know how much they got paid on, on a daily basis. We know who jumped from which position, when and where. So we can trace the, the, um, the career tra trajectories of people uh, very, uh, very precisely. And we also have a canonization of the curriculum. We, we actually have a firman from Sultan Suleiman dictating basically after consultation with the uh, with the Grand Mufti, saying, "Okay, if you want to be a graduate of uh, uh, of the the highest level in Istanbul, you have to have studied these books." And it lays out, I think, like fifty or sixty books, uh, books of tafsir, books of hadith, book, even dictionaries that you have to pretty much know inside and out uh, in order to be considered a real scholar. Now, there is a potential complaint here, which is. Here we have a alliance uh, and very close working relationship between scholars and sultans, right? And sometimes people want to complain and say that the ulama are way too close to political power here. And how can we how can we trust that they are not compromised, right? Because political rulers, I mean, they're they're not scholars and they might try to take advantage of the ulama. They're going to get a mufti to declare something to be halal when it suits their interest, even if it's not halal in the first place, which is a fair question to ask, right? How can we be sure that these scholars were, uh, uh, weren't influenced by the power and the wealth that surrounded them and that they weren't just rubber stamping everything that a sultan uh, was telling them to do? And my answer to that is if you look at the works of these scholars, you see that these guys were no slouches, right? And very often, these scholars had no problem disagreeing with the sultan, and very often they would overrule the sultan. If a sultan wanted to issue something that went directly against the sharia, the grand mufti had the political power, he had the political capital to put a stop to that and say, no, no that doesn't jive with the, with the sharia, and it's not going to work, it's not going to be enacted as law. And this is why the working relationship between Abu Saud and uh, Sultan Sulaiman is so important. Because it wasn't just Sultan Suleiman, it wasn't at all Sultan Suleiman dictating to the Grand Mufti what needs to be done. It was them working together and the Sultan, who isn't a scholar of the religious sciences, not necessarily knowing what is halal and haram at a detailed level, can work with the Grand Mufti to make sure that all of the, um, uh, all, all, all of the sultanic edicts are in accordance with the sharia. So this, this uh, charge that can be leveled at them of being too close to the government, it simply doesn't hold water. When you look at the way that these people wrote, I mean, it, these are real scholars. And very often they, they might issue some fatawa that are controversial. And if we have time, we can even mention uh, one or two. But the way that they back it up is with the sources. I mean, these are people who have studied uh, fiqh in particular and, and kalam to such a level that they're not going to just kind of issue a fatwa that doesn't make any sense. Everything that they're saying is coming from an usuli background. So it's, a, it's perhaps important for us to take a look at a few notable Ottoman ulama. We have hundreds throughout Ottoman history and uh, Tashko Prazade is actually a very important source of understanding of uh, the first 200 years of Ottoman uh, ulama. But a few that we, we should mention, Sheikh Edebali, who we talked about earlier, he is the Sheikh of 
uh, Ghazi Osman, and he is the intellectual kind of um, grandfather of the Ottomans in many ways. People look to him as the first Ottoman alim, and the fact that Osman paid uh, such, uh, he cared for uh, Sheikh Idabali so much, he married his daughter, he respected him so much. This really has a major impact on the way that Ottoman sultans and even just people working in the bureaucracy thought of uh, the, the scholarly establishment. Mullah Shamsuddin Fenari is also very important. Uh, we talked about him a few weeks ago. He is the first Grand Mufti. I put that in, in quotations here because it's not really a position yet. It evolves into what we know as the Grand Mufti uh, quite a bit later. But importantly, he studies in Ottoman lands and later in Egypt as well. By the 1500s, these three in particular, Abu Saud Effendi, Kamal Pasha Zadeh, and Tashko Prozadeh, these are all homegrown products. These are all people who have studied in the Ottoman lands and only in the Ottoman lands, and they are head and shoulders above, I shouldn't say above, we don't want to compare ulama of different regions uh, against each other, but they are great scholars of their era. As I mentioned, Abu Saud Effendi is the Grand Mufti in the time of uh, Sultan Suleiman. Actually, his office is in the Suleimania complex and it's overlooking the Bosphorus. It's a beautiful office. It's been nicely renovated. And if you're lucky, you can have a chance to, to take a peek on the inside. It's, it's a beautiful office and you can, you know, sit in the same spot where he wrote a ton of his fatawa, his tafsir of, of the Quran. It's, it's a really um, uh, incredible thing to, to see. Kamal Pasha Zadeh also served as the Grand Mufti in the, 15, in the 16th century. He is very interesting because when you look at his writings, he writes a ton of fatawa, obviously about you know, uh, issues in fiqh. He, uh, he issues rasail, uh, uh, treatises on uh, issues of tafsir, issues of kalam, issues of hadith. He also writes a notable work called Tawarikhi Ali Osman the history of the Ottoman family. And this is actually a text that is written in Ottoman Turkish, right? It's, everything else he writes, by the way, is in Arabic. Um, and generally the way that these scholars would work is, especially in the 16th century, most of their longer treatises on the Islamic sciences are in Arabic uh, and their shorter fatawa tend to be in Turkish. Uh, and we'll take a look at an example of one uh, in just a minute. But Kamal Pajazadeh writes this tarikh, this history of the Ottoman family in Ottoman Turkish. But to give you an idea of how well-rounded these scholars were and how, how uh, incredible their intellects were, if you just thumb through it, you realize it's not just in Ottoman Turkish. Almost every single page, there are uh, lines of poetry in Persian. And every now and then he brings in lines of poetry in Arabic. And as you probably know, Quoting poetry is not something that you do when you just have like an elementary understanding of a language. You only bring poetry and metaphor and, and, and rhetoric into your writing when you are a master of that language. The Ottoman Turkish language, if, if we have a little bit of time to talk about uh, the structure of that language, uh, grammatically it is uh, Turkish, um, meaning for example, the, the uh, uh, the sentence structure has the verb as the very last word, which is the exact opposite of what you'd find in Arabic and English. So it's, it's a very different uh, structure from uh, other languages. But there is a ton of Arabic vocabulary in it and a ton of Persian vocabulary and even a lot of Persian uh, grammar and Arabic grammar. So for example, the Ottomans had no problem using um, uh, uh, Arabic uh, plurals, right? Like they would use the word ulama as a plural for alim. Right now, learning Arabic morphology, sarf is not an easy subject at all. Persian mor uh, uh, morphology is also not easy, and Persian grammar is not easy. Ottoman Turkish is actually a compilation of all three of these languages. In order to really know Ottoman Turkish, you have to know Turkish, you have to know Arabic, you have to know Persian. And these scholars, when you study in these madaris, they were masters of all three languages. And when you read their works, you immediately see that, that these are no slouches whatsoever. I mean, these are real scholars. And Kamal Pasha Zadeh's Tabarikhi Ali Osman is a very good example of that. I put in quotations Ibn Kamal Basha because very often his Arabic works, uh, if you search under the name Kamal Pasha Zadeh, you won't find them. He's often credited as Ibn Kamal Basha. I mean, just to give you an idea of, uh, of um, the combination of languages here, even you look at their names, Kamal Pasha Zadeh and Tash Kupru Zadeh, uh, Pasha is a Turkish title for like a chief and Zadeh is Persian for son of. 
So he is the son of Kamal Basha, right? That's why we have Ibn Kamal Basha. Tashko Prasadi is also very important because he writes uh, a book by the name of Ashaqaiq al Nu'maniyya fi Ulama al Dawla al Uthmaniyya. This is another part of our intellectual tradition that we have lost is we don't have rhyming titles for books that are written anymore, unfortunately. It really brings a lot of beauty uh, uh, to intellectual works. But Shaqa'iq al-Nu'maniya fi ulama al-Dawla al-Uthmaniya, it's a biographical dictionary of all of the scholars that are affiliated with the Ottoman state, divided into 10 chapters, one chapter for each sultan. So the first chapter is on Osman, although he is not a sultan, but He's the first Ottoman ruler, and it begins with Sheikh Adibali, and it mentions this story of Osman having this dream and going to his Sheikh, and it mentions a few others that Osman was affiliated with. The next chapter on Orhan is a little bit longer. There's a few more entries, but each chapter gets a little bit longer, and by the time he gets to the chapter on Sultan Suleiman's ulama, there's hundreds in there, including himself. He includes a, because he himself was a, was a scholar. Um, he also writes another uh, another book called Miftah al-Sa'ada, which is essentially an encyclopedia of all the sciences. So if you ever come across a science that you're not familiar what the major books of that science are or what the science itself is, you look in that book and he tells you, this is what the science is. It deals with understanding these subjects. These are the major scholars. These are the major uh, uh, books that you need to study, et cetera, et cetera. It's really a treasure trove of uh, uh, of uh, of an encyclopedia of sciences, not just Islamic sciences, but also what we would consider quote unquote secular sciences, although they did not conceive of sciences as being divided into these two categories necessarily. All of this is to say, I mean, as quickly and as, as uh, uh, you know, uh, concisely as I can, Ottoman scholarship is enormous, especially in the 16th century, but we see this continue throughout Ottoman history. And when you look even at the very end of the Ottoman Empire, we still find great scholars like Mustafa Sabri, the last uh, Grand Mufti of the Ottoman Empire before it falls, and his student, uh, Muhammad Zahid al-Kawthari, who ends up leaving Turkey uh, when it is founded, and he lives until the 1950s in Cairo. I mean, you see even in their works, the continuation of this tradition that begins all the way back with essentially Osman and Sheikh Edabali. Now, to finish off, uh, very often people ask the question of how can I study history, right? Uh, what can I, what books can I study? Uh, how can I become a historian? Uh, the first thing that I have to advise is that studying history is not a part-time gig. Right. It's not something that you can say, oh, well, I'm going to, you know, just because of the realities of the Muslim community, unfortunately, very often we are forced or strongly encouraged to study sciences like uh, medicine and engineering and other things that are going to make us a lot of money. MashaAllah, alhamdulillah, Muslims in America have been uh, uh, blessed in that we're, we're not poor uh, as a community. Alhamdulillah. Um, but people say, okay, well, I want to become an engineer, but I, I want to become a historian on the side. And that's really not possible. In the same way that you cannot become a historian and become a doctor on the side. It is impossible. There is simply too much, not just information, but you have to understand the methodology of all of these sciences. Studying history is not just picking up history books and reading them and saying, okay, okay now I know history. It's not even picking up primary sources and reading them and saying, now I know history. Right. The, in the Ottoman case, for example, there's tons of primary source material. As I mentioned, they were very meticulous record keepers. So you can go to the archives in Istanbul and you'll find tons of stuff. You're going to find tons of uh, fatawa written by Ottoman muftis. You're going to find tons of records of who's getting paid how much and when did an army go from this city to that city? When did this battle happen? You can read all of that stuff. That does not make you a historian. You have to understand historical methods. You have to have a methodology in which you can situate all of these sources and be able to analyze them in a manner that allows you to make conclusions. And this is what we talked about in the first session uh, of this course, that different historians have different methods. Economic historians emphasize, you know, the economic history of the Ottomans or any state. Uh, intellectual historians look at what are the major theories that are guiding an empire, right, et cetera, et cetera. You have to know all of these, essentially, or at least have some kind of a background in different historical methods 
and be able to situate yourself within that, uh, that field so that you can be an effective historian. History is not just reading things and then regurgitating it. Connected with this is you have to know the languages. As I just mentioned, the Ottomans wrote in Arabic, Turkish, and Persian. If you want to be a, a historian of the Ottoman Empire, you absolutely have to know all three of those languages. And if you want to consider Ottoman Turkish to be different from modern Turkish, and I think that that's a fair uh, thing to say, uh, then that's four languages, modern Turkish, Ottoman Turkish, Arabic, and Persian. If you want to study any part of the Muslim world, whether that part, uh, whether that region spoke Arabic or not, you need to know Arabic. If you want to study the history of Central Asia, where they speak languages like Uzbek and Tajik and Kazakh and Chagatai Turkish and things like that, you still need to know Arabic because Arabic is the language of the religion that defines the entire Muslim world, right? If you want to study the history of the Indian subcontinent, you're going to have to know Arabic. You're definitely going to have to know Persian and you're in all likelihood, depending on what part of uh, India you want to study, you're going to have to know Urdu or another regional language, maybe Bengali or, or other languages. Uh, that is to say, learning these languages takes a very long time. And this is why I cannot emphasize enough and I cannot stress enough that you cannot just read translations of things and think that you are now a historian. And this connects with the third point here is to be a, beware of the amateur historian. We have a lot of people in the Muslim world. Unfortunately, again, going back to the point that uh, we're encouraged to study hard sciences, we don't have a lot of people that study history. And very often we have medical doctors writing books on history. And they don't, very often, they don't know the languages because med school is a very complex process itself. It's going to take, you know, you're probably, you're not really a doctor probably until your early 30s at best, uh, until you graduate from residency and things like that. When are you going to have time to dive into the Arabic language and the Persian language and the Turkish language? You don't have time. It's simply impossible. Uh, so you have to be very wary of where you're getting your history from. A lot of times things are written that really have no basis whatsoever. Um, people will just read uh, something like uh, Ibn Kathir's uh, history of the world and then just kind of regurgitate it and say, this is the history of Muslim society and I'm now a historian. And that's simply not how it works at all. Um, and this connects with uh, one of the things that I mentioned a few weeks ago as well which is there are gaps in Western uh, uh, historical writing because of how difficult it is to learn these languages. So a lot of the time, not all the time, but a lot of times scholars of the Ottoman Empire don't know Arabic very well. And as a result, they cannot read uh, books of fiqh, books of karam, uh, et cetera. And when they start talking about the Islamic sciences in the Ottoman Empire, they make these huge overgeneralizations that make no sense whatsoever because they don't know the intellectual tradition. Um, because learning Turkish and Arabic and Persian is, is too much essentially to expect out of people in grad school. And this brings me to the most important point uh, of this issue, as well as really this entire class, which is that you need to know your deen. And that is non-negotiable, right? Number one, if you don't know your dean, you're obviously hurting yourself to begin with. Uh, you know, if you don't, if you don't know your fault, uh, you're not practicing your dean properly. If you don't know what you're supposed to believe about Allah and His messengers, you know, your your aqidah is in danger. That is obviously the primary uh, goal, essentially, of learning our our fardain. As it relates to history, if you don't understand the Islamic intellectual tradition, you can never hope to understand the uh, forces that pushed people in history to do what they did, right? If you don't understand, uh, uh, you know, the, the history of fiqh and the history of, uh, you know, the development of the Islamic sciences, you're never going to understand how and why the Ottoman madrasa system developed the way that it did. And a lot of time when you look at uh, Western particular uh, studies of the Ottoman madrasa system, all it is is about finances. It's about who got paid how much and who, whose career advanced. I mean, I've read books about Ottoman grand muftis that don't once mention what books that mufti studied uh, when, he was, uh, when he was studying, which is atrocious. That's, that's totally ludicrous. His whole job is to be a scholar of Islamic law. How could you ignore that aspect of him? Uh, so if you want to be a historian of the Muslim world, you have to know your deen, primarily for yourself, 
and uh, secondarily, so that you can understand, uh, uh, you know, the development of Muslim societies. In any case, inshallah, this this course has been beneficial. Um, you know, anything that uh, uh, you gain, if you gain anything from this course, inshallah, it should be this last point, that this should encourage you to go and study your own deen, because this deen is, is uh, so beautiful and so grand that it caused things like the Ottoman Empire to grow out of nothing. The Ottoman Empire grows out of a wild west of the Muslim world. Uh, and it becomes the most powerful empire in the world for hundreds of years. And that's only because of uh, uh, the impact and the influence that our beautiful Dean has on people. So uh, if, if you have gained anything from this course, inshallah, it, it is that. Um, and inshallah, that also encourages you to go and study the history of other Muslim societies in different parts of the Muslim world. So Jazakumullah khair for attending. Uh, please keep me in your dot. In the meantime, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.